Amen. And we all here glad to be set free this morning. Yeah. Amen. Now listen, it's my first time back in a couple of weeks. You all got to preach with me this morning, all right? We're looking at Galatians chapter 6, verse 17. Aren't we appreciative of Gideon's ministry every single week for us? Galatians 6, 17. Paul said, from now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. He said, from now on, let no one trouble be trouble for me, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I have to bet this morning that I'm not the only one that bears a few scars on my body because of my faith in Christ. And we're going to talk about that today. Father, would you anoint me one more time to preach your word without fear or favor? Give us ears to hear, hearts that are open to receive the truth of your message. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. There is a famous scene in the movie Jaws where... Quentin Brady and Hooper are below deck and they are drinking and comparing their battle scars. When Hooper sees what he thinks is a scar on Quentin's arm, he inquires about the mark and Quentin says to him, it's not a scar, it's actually a tattoo of the USS Indianapolis that was shot down by a Japanese torpedo at the end of World War II. And of the more than 1,100 men who were on board the vessel, only 300 men survived the attack. And he said he got the tattoo to serve as a visible sign of invisible scars. This morning we look into the final witness of the Apostle Paul as he writes this theological dissertation, if you will, to the church of Galatia. As he stood in defense of of the witness of the gospel and his personal ministerial integrity. The Apostle Paul lifts for them his own personal plight and pain as he begins to unbandage his wounds and allows the church there to know that his message is authenticated by the literal scars that he bears in and on his body. Paul wants the church to know that the church of Jesus Christ is established by truth that's often authenticated by suffering. And there is a group of Jewish missionaries known as Judaizers. And they had infiltrated the church after Paul had established a very strong gospel mission there in Galatia. And this group of Jewish missionaries were now trying to claim that Paul's preaching and teaching were not relevant. They were claiming that there needed to be some additional works associated with the gospel claim. They claimed that in order for the Gentiles to be saved and accepted by the church, that they had to adhere to very strict laws of Moses. That they had to adhere to circumcision. And they had to keep the strict details and jump through all the hoops of this supposed Judaism. They had to practice all the customs and live by a religious calendar. And so Paul writes to the church of Galatia. And he says to them, listen, all you need to be saved is to place your faith alone in Christ alone through grace alone. He argues with them that a Christ plus anything else gospel is no gospel at all. Because all you need to be saved is to place your utmost confidence in a man named Jesus Christ. Paul's clear on this. He presents this claim and he argues with them that the just shall live by faith. That the only way to get set right before a holy God is to trust in him alone and his finished work on the cross and you will be saved to the uttermost. I wonder if there's anybody here this morning around this church who can testify, I am saved and I know I'm saved because Jesus Christ has given me the victory through his death on the cross. And I know we don't hear about the cross anymore in our modern contemporary churches, but if you come to the Rochester Church of the Nazarene, you're going to hear about the old rugged cross because Jesus took what Satan meant for evil. And he made something beautiful out of it. I love that old cross where the dearest and the best 
for a world of lost sinners was slain. To that old rugged cross I will ever be true because it's shame and reproach gladly bear. I wonder if I can have somebody raise their hand at this part. Then it'll call me someday to that home far away where this glory forever I'll share. At this church, we're going to hear about three specific things. The book, the blood, and the blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you with love and with urgency about the word of God. I'm going to tell you about the fact that Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture. That he was buried in the grave according to the scriptures. But early one Sunday morning, he got up out of that grave according to the scriptures. And that one day, one day soon, he is going to take us to a land where we shall never grow old. A land where the troublemakers won't trouble us anymore and the weary will finally be at rest. I'm thankful for the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for anyone who will believe. Amen? Amen. And so since they could not refute Paul's message, they attacked Paul personally. They made the claim that Paul also taught of the keeping of the law. They said, Paul, you used to teach that all men ought to be circumcised as a ritual and a customary rite. And Paul says this to them in chapter 5, verse 11. But as for me, brothers and sisters, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been eliminated. Paul says, now listen, in my early B.C. days, before I met the Lord... I did preach a message that was very Jewish. I did preach and teach that you had to keep the laws of Moses because prior to Paul meeting Jesus, he was a religious fanatic. He was a zealot. But in Acts chapter 9, Paul says something happened to him after he had received letters from the high priests to go down the road of Damascus to actively seek to exterminate the people of the way. He says something happened to me. I was blinded by Shekinah glory. It blinded me. It knocked me down on my backside. It knocked me down from my high place. He said, I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? In other words, Paul was captured by what he was trying to catch. He was apprehended by that which he was trying to arrest. And if you read Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he says, but by the grace of God, I am who I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. And somebody online or in this sanctuary this morning ought to raise your hand and testify, I am what I am because of the grace of God. Because God's grace changes whatever it touches. And nobody is ever the same when they've been contacted by God's amazing grace. Amen. Through many dangers, I need an organ player up here. Toils and snares, we have already come. T'was grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. Paul says, as for me, may I boast in nothing else except the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. For every believer that is, our only boast, Jesus made the difference for me. And church, I still weep sometimes, those silent tears, when I consider the words of the prophet Isaiah, talking about my Jesus. He was despised and abandoned by men, a man of great pain, a man familiar with sickness. And like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we had no regard for him. However, it was... And I changed the word our to my. It was my sickness that he himself bore. And my pain that he carried. Yet we ourselves assume that he had been afflicted, struck down by God, humiliated. But he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Verse 17 of Galatians is Paul's closing argument. 
Here he gives his final evidence. After long and extensive argument, Paul now gives us his concluding claim. Remember, he already told the people in Galatia, I know I've taught you about salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ, and I told you the just are going to live by faith, and redemption that we have today is through the blood of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross. But then he says, I bring to you now my final exhibit to tell you that the gospel message I believe is true and authenticated because of my own life. And Paul unbandages his wounds again. He allows the church at Galatia to know that I bear on my body the literal marks and scars given to me because of my faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says, from now on, let no man bother me. Now we can gather from that statement that those Judaizers had been causing Paul some trouble and the only reason why they were causing Paul trouble was because Paul was standing up for the truth. And may I say to some child of God listening this morning to this word, that any time you get busy doing right to the glory of God, you can expect and be ready for some trouble. You are going to have some adversity. Now maybe somebody told you long ago that if you live for God and you, and you pray often and you give and you serve, that you won't have to deal with any attacks or any adversity or any trouble or any lies being told about you, any rumors being started about you, any trusted friends turning their back on you. But no, friends, oftentimes the litmus test that proves to you and I how we're doing what God has called us to do is when we're being troubled. If you don't want any attack on your life, do nothing, be nothing, and stand for nothing, and nothing is exactly what you're going to get. But if you ever grab a hold of God-sized grace, and God-sized vision, and God-sized dreams, get ready to be knocked down, and kicked down, and wrestled down, get ready to have your good evil spoken of. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, that there was open to him a wide door for effective service. But there were many adversaries waiting for him when he opened the door. Church, when you're busy working for God, you don't have time to address petty people with their petty opinions. Because when you're busy working for God, you don't have time to chase down every rumor and every lie and every subliminal message posted somewhere on Facebook. If God be for us, I think I need a Bible reader here this morning. But if God be for us, no demon, no devil, no man, no woman, no boy, no girl, no government will be able to stop us. Paul is standing up for the truth, and he says that they have troubled me before, but after this moment, don't let anybody else trouble me. And Paul addresses his adversity, and now he starts talking about his affliction. Did you know that the word for marks in our text is the Greek word for stigmata? And the word stigmata literally means to be branded it means to have a fire brand pressed into your body. They would do this to soldiers to identify their regiment. They would do this to cattle to identify their homestead. It's the same word that we get stigmata or stigma from, and it literally means to be marked or determined by disfigurement. And when you are stamped by the grace of God, you bear the stigma of grace wherever you go. Sometimes the sad truth is that we try to fit into places that we shouldn't be fitting into and we tell on ourselves because we simply can't hide the fact that we've spent some time with Jesus. I remember back in high school, I'm going to tell on myself for a minute now, back in the 40s, <laughs> we had a party, a high school party, and everything that goes on at high school parties was going on at this party. All of the drinking, all of the music, all of the dancing, all the good stuff that happens at high school parties. If you've never been to a high school party, pretend like you know what a high school party has. And I show up at this party, and I break out some music, and they go, yeah, let's, 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 let's play some music. You know what I did? I broke out some old school newsboys at this high school party. 
And they didn't say it out loud, but I can see it through their faces. They were thinking things, man, you're killing the vibe. You are killing the mood. Let's not invite this guy to the next party. But church, I just couldn't help it. I just could not hide who I am. And when you've been with Jesus, something ought to be different about you. You've been marked. You have been sealed and branded by the Holy Spirit of God. And your words ought to be different. And your attitudes and your thoughts ought to be different. And your actions and your reactions ought to be different. Everywhere you go, you ought to be singing and shouting, Oh, victory is mine. Because I love to tell the story. It's going to be my theme in glory. To tell that old, old story of Jesus and his love. Paul is afflicted with literal marks. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul tells us his story. Read it when you get home. It'll break your heart. He said, three times I've been beaten with rods. Five times I got the Jewish lashes, 40 lashes minus one. He said, on three separate occasions I was shipwrecked at sea. One time I had people throw stones at me trying to kill me. He knew, he says, I knew what it was like to be in danger in the city, in peril in the streets and the seas, in danger from his own people. He knew what it was like to be thirsty and hungry and cold. He knew what it felt like to be ostracized and overwhelmed and sick and lonely because when you bear the name Jesus Christ, you're going to be attacked. You're going to have some affliction. And the scripture says that all of us who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer some persecution. And I need to tell you someone this morning that you are never more like Jesus than when you have received some scars. And when you have gone through a few battles, and a few, a few fires. You remember in John chapter 20, Thomas was having a crisis of faith. And he said, I would not be able to believe unless I could see some scars. And Jesus said, son, come here. Let me show you my scars. As a matter of fact, put your hands in my side and put your fingers in my nail-pierced hands. And church, these scars that I'm talking about this morning are really mercy marks. Because every one of our scars, though seen and unseen, they tell a story. And the story is the same one. I would not be where I am today if not for the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And I've got some scars on my body. I feel that I could be studied for some kind of a science experiment one day. I have a scar where a port was put in for chemotherapy. I have a scar where a pick line was put in my neck. I have a scar from major surgery on my side. I have scars from sh shoulder surgery. I have scars from knee surgeries. I have, a, I, have a, I have a scar on my nose from a pimple that showed up. I didn't have any white blood cells, and it ballooned up. I had to go to the hospital for that. I got a scar right here on my nose. And so many more. And if I can be transparent right here, I, I used to be a, I'm embarrassed of them. And I used to cover them up, but now I, I show them off because I've named each one of my scars. This might sound corny to some, but that just means you haven't been through any battles yet. Because every scar that I bear in my body and within me has the same name, and I've named it Faithful. I look at my port and I say, God was faithful. I look at my pick line and I say, God was faithful. I look at my side that has been destroyed. I say, God's been faithful. I look at my leg and the scars of up and down. I say, you know, that just tells me that God's been faithful. God is so faithful. A scar is simply a wound that's been healed. I wonder if there would be anybody brave enough today that would open up yourself like Paul did before men and say, yes, I've been scarred. Oh, I've been wounded. I've been bruised. Some of them have been self-inflicted. Others have been given me by people I trusted the most and loved the most and should have loved me the most, but it's been good for me. It's been good that I've gone through some things because these battles taught me something about myself. It taught me something about God and his word and his faithfulness. I've been through my fair share of fires, famines, and floods. I've seen lightning flash from above me. I've been broken into pieces. I've been rebuilt more times than I can count. I've got scars from disappointment. I have scars from betrayal. I've got scars that have healed, and I've got some that are still in the healing process. But through it all, God has been faithful. 
Life has taken some things from me, but the Lord has kept me in the midst of it all. And anything that I have lost, the Lord has provided for me tenfold. That is why, church, I will always give the Lord my greatest hallelujah. I'm here this morning in front of you to say thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for me. I think of a song that says, I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There's been times I didn't even know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials come only to make me strong. So I thank God for my mountains and I thank God for my valleys and I thank him for the storms that he has brought me through. Because if I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. And I'd never know what faith in his word can do. I have got some scars. You have got some scars. But thank God for them. Because they made you stronger. They refined you like a fire in a furnace. You came out the other side because you did not give up. And now you stand where you are and you can shout, Oh, thank you, Jesus, for my scars. Paul wore them like a badge of pride and said, Look at my life. Look at my body. Do you not believe that I would die for this gospel message? What can man do to me? Paul talked about how being absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. He had his mind set on heaven. And church, I want to encourage you this morning. The waters are rocky and wavy around us and wars battle everywhere we look. Listen, keep your eyes on the cross of Jesus Christ. Don't concern yourself with petty opinions of what people want you to believe and want to pull you from and what, how to make you feel. You keep your eyes on heaven because we're going someplace. We're going someplace, aren't we? And I've got heaven on my mind this morning. Now to him who is able. Isn't he able? God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Oh, to him be the glory in the church, by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Father, this morning, bless this congregation. May your face shine upon them. Empower them to live this wonderful, righteous, and holy life that you called us to live in front of all men so that even one person would know who you are by the way that we live our life. Bless them, Jesus, I pray. And in turn, let us be a blessing because there is somebody we're going to come in contact with this week that needs to know the blessed hope found only in Jesus Christ. And what a privilege it would be if we were the ones that you would call to be used in such a time as this to bring somebody's soul that much closer to the wonderful knowledge of the truth that we have in our risen Savior who is soon coming again. We give you praise and thanks for all that you are and all that you are doing and have done and will do. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church said, amen and amen. May God bless. Each and every one of you, you are dismissed.